Hi, I'm Tracy. I'm April. And And this this is Killer Spirits. Spirits. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Sunday. Welcome it's to our show. Sunday at our show. <laughs> episode 22. Yeah. Episode 22. Welcome to it. Here we are. 22 weeks. 22. Not really 22 weeks. No. We do some double episodes. Yeah. And then we missed a week. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I'm just playing with my drink. Oh, we have a good drink for you today, too. Um, How was your week? It was good. You know. Not that we haven't talked literally the most <laughs> ever this weekend. I know. We were busy this weekend together, we're too. Together all day yesterday <laughs> and for several hours today. So You think we get tired of each other, but we don't. I know. You think we'd be talked out, but we never stop. <laughs> we never stop. <laughs> we went wine tasting yesterday. It was fun. We had some, um, what do they call that? Like club order. A member orders to pick up. Yeah, that was fun. Beautiful day. Beautiful day. It was a little Didn't chill. Didn't even chill. snow for a sec, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> even though he told us it would. Yeah. So but it's going to snow. It didn't snow. It didn't snow. It I was even, even wearing cold. flippy floppies. Yeah. It was a beautiful day. It was. I had a little sunburn on the side of my face. Have a little bit of charcuterie board. Oh my God, the charcuterie is so good. Charcuterie. <laughs> Except we got, okay. Not shout out, shout out to Trader Joe's. What the fuck, dude? <laughs> How we <laughs> <laughs> triple cream brie is like the best. Was it double or triple? I think it was triple. It's one of the best cheeses. We get it all the time, mm-hmm. and I fucking know what it smells like. <laughs> <laughs> this cheese was like dirty, wet sock. Would you say dead man's toes? I said it was fungus growing in between dead man's toes. It was so <laughs> bad. It smelled like just like sink funk. It, it was, was <laughs> really bad. It was worse than sink funk. It was like the bottom of a dumpster it was so smell. We had to throw it out. It was so bad. It was really bad. I had to wash You took it out of the plastic and we were like, ooh. Oh, we're like repulsed. <laughs> we like both backed up from it. I'm like. Is this, this smell is normal to you? Because you know that stinky cheese smell. Yeah. And so sometimes you're like, oh, this smells kind of funky, but it's I actually li- stinky cheese, but which I like is fine. Stinky cheese. Yeah. That was that was not that was spoiled the funky, cheese. chinky, chinky, <laughs> stinky, stinky cheese. cheese smell. Oh my gosh. It wasn't. So no. it was terrible. We had to throw it away. We had to throw it out. So come on, Trader Joe's. You owe me seven dollars. <laughs> That was the first time that's ever happened to me, though, from them. Yeah. Normally, their cheeses are and sublime. And it was, like, discolored, even. Yeah. Was, like, I think brown. it was just a mistake. Uh, and I happened to choose the one mistake that they had. The rest of the cheese was very good. Yeah. We had some, like, very phallic-looking salamis. <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> I think it was, like, an old-world salami. It's, like, bent on the end. Yeah. No, it definitely looked, like, a rustic. I yes. think would be the right word. Yeah. It was phallic. It was really good. What else do we do? There was some beer and mustard cheese that we had. Oh, yeah. The pub mustard cheese. Yeah. It was kind of interesting, though. I don't think I was really into it because it... It should have been sharper. It tasted basically like I was eating solid mustard. I don't really know if I want to eat solid mustard. Like a mustard mustard gelatin. (laughs) Like if you just suspended brown deli mustard (laughs) in like a brick. Yeah. So, you know, come back here every week and we'll tell you all about our <laughs> charcuterie board experiences. <laughs> the best part was the candied pecans. Oh, yeah. Those were always good. The honey goat cheese. Always good. And the spinach dip. Oh, yeah. Which, which was, was a last minute addition. And it was fantastic. Didn't which, think it was going to hit that good and it did. It really did with some wine. And a baguette. And a baguette. Yeah. I think that's my favorite food on the planet. Snacks. Yeah, just, you know, a board with, like, random, like, cheeses and crackers and, yeah. you know, bread and I don't know. We're even so invested in this, we have a travel board with a knife that fits in the board. We do. We're ready. We're we're, we're ready to roll when this happens. Mm-hmm. I get really excited about 
I think one time we even went on a, um, remember when we went on our little road trip last time and I basically just had on my lap cause you know, I was the passenger <laughs> oh, yeah. and we basically just got all this charcuterie and I just like had it on my lap and yeah. we just ate off of it in the car while I was driving. That's how we, that's how we roll. That was when we went to LA. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. <laughs> Or Anaheim or something. Oh, what's our restaurant we love? Let's give them a shout out. Haven. Oh my God, it's so good. Okay, if you guys are ever in Anaheim or like, I guess it's technically it's Orange. Orange County. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a little downtown area of Orange. It's so cute too. This place called Haven is literally the best. It's so and good. The chef's name is Brady. Um, and I've talked to him on Instagram multiple times, and he responds back to me that's the best. He's he like, is so good. little sassy attitude. Because, <laughs> like, I remember one time he posted about COVID, and it was, like, when nobody could really get food. Oh, yeah. Like, the restaurants were having a hard time getting their shipments yeah, of food. Yeah, totally. And he said that somebody had complained about them not having something. You know, like, they had some... Pandemic A people. different kind of meat or something. Yeah. You know, they didn't have ribeyes. They had something else mm-hmm. and he was like look brad <laughs> i'm sorry that i cannot accommodate your ribeye request like we're in a fucking pandemonium you know <laughs> pandemonium whatever he said <laughs> and so i just i just responded back to him and i was like i would be so fucking happy if you gave me anything yeah i wouldn't even have to order it you could just bring it to my table just, and i would fucking eat it because yeah. it's that good bring me a fucking flip-flop I'll i don't even happy. know what it is <laughs> You don't even have to. It could be some meat I've never even heard of, and I would eat it if it came out of your kitchen. And also, fuck Brad. <laughs> and he was like, "Yeah, I think you did hashtag fuck Brad." Oh yeah, hashtag fuck Brad. <laughs> yeah, it's a great place, and it's funny. The reason we even went there, we tried to go to this other place, and they were super rude, snobby doodle. And I don't remember the name. I'm not going to say their name or anything because honestly, I don't even remember. But they were on that street. Yes. And they were real kind of snobby with us and we're like, whatever. We just wanted to have a relaxed dinner. Mm-hmm. We weren't trying to go to some bougie loogie place. And we happened to see and I think it was just a pub and you think, Oh, okay, well pub food's usually good. Mm-hmm. No, this is pub food elevated. Oh, it was so good. It is I mean And their waitresses were adorable. They're adorable waitresses. The food is I mean, it is it's so good. The chef is so good. So I was good. very impressed. Yes. And I think we've gone twice and we're ready to take a six hour road trip to go back just to go to Haven. So that I would drive that down there right now. I would drive down there right now. And maybe the next long weekend. Yeah, we're doing it. COVID or not, I'm there. Yes. <laughs> I think they can still see this outside. Yeah, they Once can. Once it warms up. Let's do it. So let's talk about our drink today, though. Okay. Because I really like it. So today's drink is called the Italian Curse. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. and for the Italian part, we did limoncello and prosecco. Sing your song <laughs> that you have in your head for two days. <laughs> no, it's in your head for two <laughs> no, days. It's your head. I don't think so. You were just singing it. Hey, mambo, mambo <laughs> Italiano. <laughs> it's so. And I thought they were saying manja, and I was saying it wrong. I mean, manja is Italian. No, I know, but then you're like, you're not. They don't say manja, you idiot. They're saying mambo. Like, oh, oh maybe okay, are. I can mambo and manja. Um, so I was reading about limoncello. And of course, it's produced in Italy. And it's often homemade. Oh. Because it's very easy to make. Is it? Yeah, so you can use like grappa, which is like wine liqueur. Okay. Or vodka. And do lemon peels in it. Mm-hmm. Like you would do a flavored vodka. But it's different because the essential oils are suspended in the drink, which gives it the cloudy appearance. Oh. Which is also called the ouzo effect. Ouzo? Ouzo effect is... Because it's oozing? No. (laughs) It's the emulsification (laughs) of the oils into the liquor. Oh, okay. Which is the same thing that happens with absinthe. When they drip the water. You know, they drip the water over the top and then it gets turns from green to cloudy. Yeah. Absinthe is disgusting. I'm sorry. Yeah. But some people probably like it. I do not. Oil and water emulsion. Okay. So it turns like milky. That's that was pretty cool. It's a very beautiful color too. It is. It's like bright, bright yellow. Yeah. Um. So today's recipe, um, has muddled fresh lime. So I used my <laughs> um, mixing pitcher today. I muddled the fresh lime in the bottom, just like I don't know, two sprigs. I took the leaves off. Uh, did one ounce of limoncello, two ounces of gin. 
three quarters ounce of lemon or lime juice, and about a half an ounce of simple syrup. I stirred it with ice, um, which kind of dilutes it, and then put it into champagne glasses with lemon wheels in them, um, and then poured Prosecco over the top, which is also Italian, <laughs> and uh, put a thyme sprig in the side as garnish. It's beautiful. It's very good. It's very refreshing. It is. It's not like overly sweet. No, it's not sweet at all. It has a good lemon flavor, mm-hmm. good Prosecco. Yeah, and I think something really easy you could make at home that kind of has a nice dynamic effect. Oh, yeah. You know. Nice and lemony. And I don't really know if, I, if I've had many cocktails that have thyme in it. Mm-mm. So that's new and different, and I like it. And when it you good. take a drink, you kind of sniff the thyme, mm-hmm. and it's like, it, it smells really fresh. And- this is another one I got from that. Do you remember I talked about that chart? It oh, had like yeah. the fruits matched with the botanicals, mm-hmm. um, which I looked at again today. I think it's from Penn State, of okay. all things. Well, we gotta do something good there. Yeah. So if you're, <laughs> I was looking at other ones that that pair with lemon, and you could do like rosemary. Oh yeah, um, oregano. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which would be more of like a Greek style. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So there's a bunch of things that you could do with lemon that you could do the same recipe but do a different herb. Well, I love it. Yeah. It's good. It's not, we haven't made anything like this before. No. So it's fun to make new stuff. I still really liked our last week one we did, the red one. The Bloody Valentine. The Bloody Valentine. That was a good one. I think that might be in my tops. I don't know. I keep saying that every time we have a new one. I'm like, oh, this is my tops. No, this is my top. Oh, wait. No, this is my top. (laughs) I think (laughs) this is one of my favorites. I love the hot buttered rum. Yeah. That was one of my absolute favorites. That was really good. Um... I feel like the the French catacombs martini I liked. Oh, that was also last week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was good, too. Yeah. I know. It's hard to choose. They're like your children. You love them all. <laughs> They're like your children. Except the ones that we pour out and don't tell you about. They, those are <laughs> shit. Yeah, we just, we try. Luckily, we didn't have any of that today. Oh, do you want to talk about our Chambord test? Oh, yes. Go ahead and tell them. Okay, so we've heard... Okay, we've tried to use the like knockoff, what is it, de coops? De crups? Oh, the razzmatazz. Razzmatazz, <laughs> which is like a raz- sweet raspberry liqueur, black raspberry liqueur. Yeah. Which is supposed to be comparable to Chambord. Mm-hmm. Well, we used, tried to use it last week in a drink, and it, it tasted awful. like absolute ass. I mean, so bad. <laughs> it was terrible. We poured it out so fast, I didn't even feel bad about wasting the alcohol. <laughs> no, and it was a big pour, too. Yes. So we're like, oh, shit. Well, maybe, I mean, all these recipes are calling for Chambord, which is like, you know, the $40 bottle. Well, Rasmataz is like $12. Yeah. Which is why I got the Rasmataz anyway in the first place. Yeah. So we decided today to buy a mini bottle of Chambord. We'll do a side-by-side taste test. Yours was blind. Mine wasn't. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I don't know which is which. Uh, turns out they both taste like shit. <laughs> they kind of do yeah we hated both of them though we did realize they did taste similar they did taste similar the chambord is less sweet yeah um so i mean the rasmataz is more syrupy yeah i but mean they it, both taste like nyquil they do so. taste like cherry nyquil so. like the red nyquil i don't know i think the chambord mixed with things would be really good i could see the difference because the rasmataz was like it's just too much it's dude thick it's too much so i don't know We'll get around to making something with Chambord. I know I've seen like a, um, what am I thinking of? It's a something Royale. It was like Kirsch Royale or something. Oh, okay. With, um, that has Chambord in it. I think we just need to find the, the right best. drink. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll be able to do it. Don't do a peanut butter and jelly shot. That's the <laughs> worst way to drink it. And don't drink it by itself because it's gross. It's kind of gross. Yeah. yeah. So we'll work on that one. But again, Fireball's kind of gross by itself, too. I've done it. Oh, yeah. I don't like hot cinnamon. It's weird. It's not my fave. Or like hot cinnamon candy or... Okay. Speaking of psychopaths, because this is our show. (laughs) If you use hot cinnamon toothpaste... What? You're a psychopath. Who does this? People do it. People you know? No. I'm not friends with any psychos. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) If you are using hot cinnamon toothpaste... You need to, you need to try something else. I didn't even know this existed. Oh, it exists! Wow, can you imagine the gum burning? No, 
it's like chewing big red gum <laughs> first thing in the Gross. morning. I can't. <laughs> Anyway. Okay, we digress. We digress. Let's get started on our story today. Okay, I'm ready. Our actual Italian story. So today we're going to talk about Leonardo Cianciulli, and she's the tea cake and soap maker of Italy. Hmm. So I don't know if you've ever heard of this story before. I haven't. But I do I, love a tea cake, though. You do have a tea cake? No, I love a tea cake. Oh, I know. I love a good tea cake. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love a good tea party. We could really just do this whole episode talking about tea <laughs> and tea cakes. We could do. We just talk about food. Yeah. That's, that's our new Charcu- podcast. Charcuterie cheese and tea. Tune in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my sources. I use this book called The Curse, A Shocking True Story of Superstition, Human Sacrifice, and Cannibalism. Okay. By Ryan Green. Really good. Not it's an easy read. It's like 130 pages, I think. Hmm. Um, and it, I, I almost want to say I got it free on, um, you know, like on, oh, like a Kindle. Yeah, yeah. It was okay. like when one of those. that's like when you sign up for it, you get it for free or something yeah. like that. So, it's actually a really good read. I highly recommend it. And also, I use Murderpedia. Murderpedia. Slightly use Murderpedia. Sometimes they get a little wild on there. They get a little wild. I'm like, this is not even real. <laughs> but I do like them. Okay, so Leonardo Cianciulli's mother's name was Amelia Danolfi, and she lived in the small town of Montella Avellino in the south of Italy. She was actually considered really beautiful for her for that time. Oh, okay. And her, I mean, probably for any time. What am I talking about? She's probably beautiful for this time too. Mm-hmm. Um, and her family was considered well off. So she was from a well to do family. She had a good reputation. She had a decent dowry on offer from her parents. Mm. And of course, she was beautiful. So she had a promising future ahead of her. A man in town by the name of Mariano Cianciulli set his sights on her. Oh, okay. Okay. But he, she was way out of his league socially. Oh. Okay. So. Just to set the stage, this is the late 18, 1800s. Mm-hmm. So she would not have looked at him or been into him. And he was also kind of known for being a drinker and being a little wild. A scoundrel. He was a, he was definitely a scoundrel. And so he, he but he wanted her and he w- would watch her a lot. Okay. And he took what he wanted. Okay. So one night, she was actually visiting um, another suitor, I guess. So that's kind of the thing where you're like visiting different people and then you decide like who you're going to oh, marry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, so she was kind of She's on like a date courting. per se. Yeah. She was being courted by multiple men while she was walking home and he actually attacked her by dragging her into a field and he raped her. Jesus. Yeah. So, and of course, this is the 1800s. So right. when women got raped, it was like rife with stigma. Mm hmm. Your purity is, like, of the utmost importance. It, it doesn't even matter how the fuck it was taken from you. doesn't matter that it was your fault. doesn't matter any of that. So, to her, she felt no longer pure. And she was also very Catholic. Mm-hmm. So, she was completely filled with shame. And she was really young. So, I don't know if she, like, quite understood everything. Like, you know, she knew about, like, kind of what happens on a marriage night. But, I mean, she was very young. She was very naive. Mm-hmm. So, she pretty much just, like picked herself up out of this field and took herself home and went to bed. Okay. Poor girl. No. Yeah. It's very, very sad. So she was extremely traumatized. She said nothing to anyone. Right. But she got pregnant from this attack. Oh, fuck. Yes. And I couldn't find anywhere exactly how old she was, but I'm guessing she's somewhere in her late teens. That's just a guess. And Mariana was most likely in his 20s because he was older than her. Mm Mm-hmm. So, of course, she tried to ignore it, I'm sure, which is not a new thing. I'm, there's been other women and young girls in this world who just think, oh, if I don't pay attention to this, this is not. I'm sorry. It's still gross. Yeah. <laughs> the baby's there. But I don't know if she fully understood what was happening. So she started to show after a while. And then her parents were like, what the fuck? Who are you with? And during this time, Mariona had actually been watching her still this whole time, kind of waiting to see. Does she have the guts to report me? Like, he actually enjoyed watching her show fear of him on the street. What a fucking creep. No, he was a fucking lunatic. So, when her parents came to her and said, oh, you know, like, what, 
who's this person mm-hmm. who has done this to you and you know who are you with she actually refused to say anything to them at first but then they were like oh, fine we're gonna go to every house of every man and we're gonna ask and then she was like oh shit because i mean you know just out her whole shame you know yeah that's horrifying so she she finally did give them mariano's name and she told them the day it happened but she did not say that it was rape okay Okay. so of course the very next night mariano and the other chanchuli family members were there at the dinolfi's table and the marriage was arraigned arranged that's horrifying it's pretty horrifying and of course he was over the moon yeah you know and i and i was worked out yeah and I almost feel like, you know, the fact that she was had much higher standing than him in, you know, in socially. Mm-hmm. And I think he was just a very bitter and angry person. I really feel like what he did was just like to knock her down a notch too, yeah. like you know, like oh, you think you're so beautiful. Oh, and you fancy. think you're so great. Yeah, yeah, I'll show you. And I and that's exactly what he did. So, like I said, he was over the moon. And pretty soon they brought a priest in to do the vows discreetly. And that's when she pretty much entered her own hell. Oh, God. Yeah. So you can probably guess that Mariano was not a kind and loving husband. No. He was cruel. He was abusive. He continued to rape her. He would slap her when the house wasn't clean enough or other things were not to his liking. And in the eyes of the town, no one helped her. No one gave a shit about her. She was basically getting what she deserved for being promiscuous. Right. You know? So in in April 1894, Amelia gave birth to a daughter by the name of Leonardo Chanchuli. So now Amelia lived with an abusive drunk in the most impoverished part of town with a child. So they had no money. Like she was literally living in a hovel. So hovel? after you, after you, hovel or hovel. <laughs> after you get married your parents were like fuck off. Yeah. Oh, that is exactly what happened. That sucks. They gave her no mind at all. So, unfortunately, Amelia felt nothing for her baby except for contempt. And she was actually a horribly abusive mother, both physically and emotionally. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they moved around a lot in in, um, her early years, in Leonardo's early years, due to having no money. And also because Mariana would spend any money they had on booze and never bothered to buy rent, like buy food or pay rent. You know, he had his priorities, you know. So the only way Amelia and Leonardo even survived was through the charities of other the charity of others in the church, which of course was a constant source of shame for Amelia, but they had to take what they could get. Right. So every ounce of, of frustration and loathing that she felt for her life was directed to her daughter. Because she couldn't direct it to Mariano because he was violent and she was scared of him. Right. So, of course. A helpless baby. Yep. So three years into their marriage, Mariano all all of a sudden stopped coming home, which at first wasn't that big of a deal because, you know, he would go on binges or whatever. But after a while, Amelia did go looking for him, mostly out of necessity, because she's like, you know, hello, like we need food, blah, blah, blah. And she found him at a friend's house, at one of his friend's house on his deathbed. What the fuck? Yeah. So they helped her take him back to their hovel and... I mean, really is home, but I say that loosely because it really was a hovel. <laughs> and she pretty much just left him there to die. Like, she didn't try to, like, nurse him back to health or anything. I mean, would you? Uh, no. I'd be like, fuck you, fucker. Yeah, just fucking die. <clears throat> and he did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he died. Did and he she... have some kind of, like, disease or something? I don't know. Yeah. It's unclear. He just banged his head or? Who knows? Maybe he just drank himself to death. Maybe. Who knows? You know? Well, he was older than her. Right? He was older. Yeah, I'm not sure how much older, but mm-hmm. he definitely was older. So, um, she was thinking, okay, great. He's dead. I'm going to finally get out of this hell. So she thought her family would welcome her back, but they so did not. Okay. Yeah. She was completely ostracized and ignored and, you know, they, there was still a lot of shame attached to her and her family did not want that Mm -hmm. near them at all. Like we're in high standing. Yeah. And we don't want that. Yeah. How you could just disown your own child is beyond me, but okay. So... I know it was a different time, so yeah. I'm glad that, that, I mean, I'm sure that still happens mm-hmm. places. Yeah. Well, it depends on how horrible of a daughter you are. Yeah. Like, I mean, if she was doing things like she shouldn't have been doing. Right. 
I can understand that to some Yeah, but not this reason. No. I mean, the fact that she was an abusive mother is a reason (laughs) to me, but then someone should have come in and saved that child. Yeah. But I don't think anyone was paying any fucking attention, to be to be honest. So her only option at this point was to find a new husband, of mm-hmm. course. And her second husband, you know, he lavished her with expensive shit, and she was smitten pretty quickly. Well, that's nice. But he didn't really have the money to be doing that. Oh, okay. Yeah, and pretty soon he burned through all their money. Oh, so okay. he he was she wasn't much better off financially than she was before. Hmm. Though it doesn't seem like this husband was as cruel and abusive but i mean she was continually abusing leonarda and he never stepped in yeah. so he's still complicit how uncomfortable very i'd be so uncomfortable if like i was with somebody that just hit their kid all the time yeah i don't like, it's just don't do that. hard to imagine that it's weird it's very odd yeah so at age 12, Leonardo attempted suicide for the first time oh jeez yeah and she actually made a noose by tying together the filthy bed sheets and slinging them over the exposed rafters of her farmhouse where they'd been staying. But her knot tying sucked, and her noose came apart before... she's only 12. I know. It came apart before it could kill her. But even so, she still damaged herself, and she spent a week unable to speak because she crushed her larynx in the attempt. Oh, jeez. And her mother didn't even notice. Oh. Didn't even notice. Or if she did, she never said anything. Yeah, crazy. She tried again at age 13 and failed again. And as she grew older, her mother did notice that she was, you know, huh, she's quite beautiful. So, ding, ding. And we're out. Mama, well, not just, Mama's starting to think about what kind of marriage can I get her. Oh. It's going to. So I guess, yeah, kind of pimp her out. In a way, yeah, yeah. But also, I mean, that was also part of the, you know, that's what you did. You right. look for the right match or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, but really her thought was, how is this going to benefit me? Mm-hmm. Like, who can I get her to marry? That's going to benefit me. But Leonardo had her own plans in 1917. She was 23 and which is kind of late, I would think to be getting married back yeah. then, but she was more than ready to get out from under her mother's thumb. And she had decided to choose her own husband. Mm. So she told Amelia about who she chose and Amelia was like, hail to the no. I don't, you're not marrying this person. Oh. Well, Leonardo had chosen Raffaele Pansardi, and he was a low paying, he had a low paying government job. Okay. And he was several years, several years older than her. And I think her mom was like, no, he's got this low paying job. Like, I want you to marry someone with some standing because it's going to help me. Right. This doesn't benefit me right. at all. Yeah. Right. So, <clears throat> Leonardo was pissed, of course, and was basically like, F you, and she didn't bother to tell Leonardo that she was, you know, that she was just going to go ahead with this marriage anyway. Right. And Amelia didn't tell her daughter, she didn't tell Leonardo, oh, I actually have some other people that I'm looking at for you. She never said she that. She just said no. So, maybe if she had said that, maybe things would have been different, but she yeah. didn't. So, Leonardo was like, bye, bitch, and she accepted Raffaele's proposal and they were married okay but Amelia did not attend oh well good for her yeah so when Leonardo returned to the house to get the belong any like her belongings that she left behind after her wedding Amelia told her that like well first she was expecting like her mom was gonna like rage at her she's gonna scream at her she's gonna hit her because that's what she's been done her whole life she didn't she was super calm and she just said I curse your marriage so, in Leonardo's eyes, this was actually way worse than, like, a physical attack from her. She took this to heart, and she truly believed that her marriage was cursed. Oh. Yeah. So, from that point on, Amelia would ignore Leonardo if she ever saw her on the street. Isn't that crazy? Like, she didn't even exist. So, she just did what her own family did to her. Exactly. She act exactly The legacy did. lives on. The legacy lives on. So Leonardo was also prone to seizures. She most likely had epilepsy, but she was never diagnosed. Oh. She really thought that that was, you know, somehow connected to this curse. Oh, And they, yeah, and they happened a lot when she was under stress. And she was under stress a lot. (laughs) That's actually like a common trigger for seizures. Exactly. 
Um, so her husband loved her and he was kind to her. I mean, he was like a pretty gentle person. That's good. And even though she was, you know, basically free from her abuser, AKA her mother, um, she was, she kind of, which is true for a lot of us, but even more so for those who've been abused, she had her own internal critic. Oh yeah. And she was really suffering from childhood trauma at this point. Mm -hmm. And even the slightest inconveniences were like a huge drama to her. And she was always just living like he was going to beat her at any minute. Yeah. You know, and he's like, I'm not, it's fine that you I'm burn not, the food. It's, you know. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Right. But she, he was not about that life at all, but she was, you know, really in that psyche right. for a long time. So Leonardo had actually inherited Romani blood from her father's side. And many of the Romani people were nomadic, like the gypsies. Okay. At that time. So her mother had always told her to steer clear of them and so she really lived in fear of the traveling Romani, like, her entire life. And I think there was a lot of stigma around them, too. Yeah. You know, kind of like, oh, the gypsies, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they're like thieves. And right. But she was desperate, and she sought them out, and she found a fortune teller at a seasonal fair, and she begged her to do a reading oh, okay. for her. And so the palm reader led her into a stall and sat her down. And before the reading could even begin, Leonardo was like, am I going to die? You know, because she was really concerned about this Aww. curse. You know, is that what the curse is going to do? Like, what is it? What's this curse going to do to me? And so the fortune teller took both of her hands and she traced her lifeline with a fingertip and said, no, you're not going to die. Not for a long time. And she was like, whew, <laughs> that's good to know, right? Yeah. But then the fortune teller said, however... You're going to live a long life full of sadness, and you will outlive every one of your children. Oh. So, yeah. That was not something that she wanted to hear. Sad. She doesn't even have any children at that point. Not any children yet. So, it took three years for her to become pregnant. Mm -hmm. Within three months, she suffered her first miscarriage. Oh. Yeah. In 1920, they moved from Montella and scraped by for the next year, barely having enough money to feed themselves. And finally, in 1921, they settled more permanently in Raffaele's childhood home of Laria Potenza. And they both had jobs, and they started living a better life. Like, okay. I think she had a part-time job at this point. In 1922, Leonardo gave birth to her eldest son, Giuseppe. And she was feeling what pretty good. What a good name. And it was not a great name. Giuseppe. I love that we name. We were talking about names yesterday. So yeah, we that's were. That's on the list. You're going to put Giuseppe on your list? I love it. Yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> I kind of like that it, that it starts with a G, too. Yeah. So she was feeling pretty good at this point. Her anxiety was better. I mean, most likely because, you know, they had moved far away from her mother. And, you know, the anxiety of just surviving was gone. But after Giuseppe, she suffered another miscarriage. So then she gave birth to two girls in quick succession. And then another boy soon after. So she was, like, pregnant, 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 yeah, pregnant. Four yeah. Four by now. And then these children started to become sick. Oh. One of the girls had bad lungs, and she would basically just cough and cough and cough. Aww. I know. And Leonardo would actually sleep at night, like, having her propped up so that, you know, would hold her all night propped up so that she could breathe better. So the Leonardo cared for her children. No, she was obsessed with her children. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think... Not like her mom. No. No, not like her mom. I think she swung too far to the other side, though, which oh, we're going to talk about. Okay. Um, I think she she really, truly loved her children. Um, and, you know, I, it, I don't believe she was ever abusive to them. Okay. I think she was smothering to them. Oh, okay. Though. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and I think as her mental health broke down, it got way worse. Oh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so like I said, she would hold her up at night you know, night after night to help her breathe. And, you know, again, this is 1920-something. I don't know shit. There's not a lot of health care, no. you know. There's no inhalers. No, there's nothing like that. But, I mean, she was a toddler and she just died in her arms one night. Oh, yeah. poor baby. And so the blow to her mental health was very, very rough. Mm -hmm. You know, her grieving, she would, she tore chunks out of, of, like hair out of her head yeah 
Yeah, she abandoned her part-time job and she spent all of her waking moments like hovering over her surviving children. Oh, because she was terrified. She was absolutely terrified, which I mean, I... I, It's heartbreaking. It's very heartbreaking and understandable, Mm -hmm. you know? So she never let Giuseppe out of her sight. She was not allowed to play outside, which is not very far off from nowadays. (laughs) Not super healthy for your kids. Not super healthy, yeah, for real. And she did continue to have children over the years, and her paranoia grew worse. There were no more miscarriages, but each of Leonardo's children sickened and died before they reached their third year. It was the fortune teller. It was the fortune teller? Yeah. Well, she called it. Yeah. Five little boys died, and her sanity kept slipping and slipping and slipping during How does this. that happen? I don't know. I, I mean, mean, the likelihood is so slim. That you I have mean, that many kids and they all die. When you're living in poverty and there's diseases that are yeah. going around. I mean, it is, it, it happened. It happened a lot. They just wipe out entire families. They did. Yeah. And, you know, when, when they're so small, they're so susceptible. Mm-hmm. So she had two surviving children at this point and Raffaella convinced her to get a job thinking it would be therapeutic for her. Like, okay, all you're doing is like hovering over these children. Yeah. Take your mind off the kids. Yeah. Like, I think it's good for you. Like, go get this job. And so she did. She did go get a job, like a part-time job. She was actually, you know, it was good for her. But while she was at work, her 10th child died. Okay. I know, right? And So she always had it in her mind, if she had more money, the curse would not be able to touch her babies. Which I kind of understand, because she felt like she needed enough money to call out a doctor at the first sign of sickness, which mm-hmm. she couldn't really do. It's not like healthcare was a thing. She needed a house outside the city where disease spread so right. readily. Yeah. That would be helpful. And so, I mean, her thought process was right, you know. I'm going to get some money and get these kids the hell out of here. Exactly. So she was, so her job at the time, she was working as a cleaner at the town's bank. Mm-hmm. And in the bank, she had no access to cash, actually. But she did have access to ledgers and records. Okay. Okay. So she ended up creating a false account and noted that it contained a certain amount of money, okay. which she thought was sufficient for herself mm-hmm. and her children. And in her mind, this was like a matter of life or death to have this money. Yeah. So she was, she was very totally desperate, justified in her own mind. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> the, this clerical error, quote unquote, clerical error that she created appeared in the books was spotted very quickly. Oh. And so it's not like, okay, well, who did, we don't know who did it. But we spotted it. Yeah. But then she just, you know, sashayed right into the bank and, you know, cleared out this account one day. And it's kind of like, okay, well, we know that you're like a poor cleaner. So. Hey, you work here. We know you. Yeah. So the police escorted her out. Blah, blah, blah. She was definitely caught. And for her fraud, she was convicted, sentenced, and imprisoned in 1927. Oh. And how many kids does she have at this point? Like four? Well, I think she had one. Oh, just one. I think she just had Giuseppe. Oh. At this point. Her first. Yeah. So in all likelihood, her husband was also like, his name was probably dragged through the mud because you know how that happens. And, you know, she did make it abundantly clear in her confession that she worked alone and she was like, quote unquote, seized by madness. So that was probably help. Like he wasn't a part of this. It's a curse. It's the curse. <laughs> so of course, in 1920s Italy, women were t- were to receive exactly the same punishment as men for the same crimes. Okay. But stipulations were made to allow women to serve short sentences on house arrest, or for longer sentences, be confined to like a quote unquote special institution built to house female prisoners. Mm. Okay. I would take the house arrest. <laughs> well, I don't know if you have a choice. <laughs> I I am currently on the house arrest COVID. Oh, well, yeah. So prior to the unification of Italy, prisoners were, or prisons were kind of like medieval dungeons, mm-hmm. you know, kind of yeah. like old school Europe, you know, Spooky. they were deployed against enemies of the noble family and all that. Mm-hmm. In post unification Italy, they'd really done all they could to change this atmosphere and, you know, kind of change, you know corrections per se (laughs) like give you a dorm style life instead of yeah maybe not that good but i mean there was more of an air of fairness and Mm. things happening um so the conditions were better in prisons but for women 
This was not the case. Oh. There was no similar structure available to the state to house the minority of female prisoners. Probably because there wasn't a lot. Probably. But there was one long-standing... There's still not a lot. No, there's no, but there was one long-standing institution in Italy that was accustomed to jailing women for long periods. The church. Oh. Of course. Was it just called the church or it was the church? It, the Catholic church. Oh, okay. Yeah. So almost every city had a reformatory where young women who might, like, damage their family's honor were sent to live out their days. Yeah. It's basically just a way to, like, tuck them away somewhere. Yeah. um, Because, you know, we can't can't have that. So that's pretty much where she went. I bet the nuns keep a close eye on them, too. Oh, did they ever. Yes. So it was one of these repurposed reformatories that Leonardo was sent to for her sentence. Hmm. And it was a building that had once been a nunnery, but now held every female prisoner from the entire province under the watchful eye of the institution's mother superior. Ooh. And of course, you know, the nuns, they're always known for fairness and kindness, aren't they? (laughs) (laughs) They're always known for not hitting your kids. Yeah, they're always known for just being so understanding. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, no. Life in the prison was super bleak, and additional years were added to many sentences at the whim of... Of whichever nun was in charge. So, like, if I was in charge, I'm like, you got five more years, bitch. Because oh. I don't like you today. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. The only option for women confined there, if they wanted to get out, was complete and utter subservience. Mm. So just don't make any noise. Right. Don't argue. Yep. Do what you're told to do and just get through it. But luckily for Leonardo, she pretty much lived her whole life in subservience with her mother. That's so true. she was actually... Very, she was fine there. She's like, oh, these nuns are cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't <laughs> know if totally she thought normal. that, but she knew how to conform very yeah. easily. So she served her 18-month sentence before being returned to Raffaele's care, which mm. I think is so funny how they say that. But Care. Yeah. Like he's going to now care for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, the, I mean, the one thought that she always thought when she was in prison was her son, Giuseppe, Oh, yeah. Like, I got to get out for Giuseppe. You know, I got to take care of Giuseppe. I mean, this 18 months that she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And she's she's like, you know, Raphael, I can't do this, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So she really wanted to get out and be with him. Mm -hmm. So Raphael had lost his job and most likely because of her issues. Yeah. So they moved again to Lacedonia where she was able to secure a job or where he was able he was able to secure a job. So soon after settling there. She was pregnant again. Oh, okay. Yeah. Even though she was feeling more settled, she always was worried about the curse. Okay? She was worried it's going to show itself at any minute. So, again, she sought out a fortune teller who was passing through in one of the Romani caravans. And this time, the fortune teller said, in one hand, I see prison, in another, a mental asylum. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, back then, a mental asylum was way worse than prison. Yeah, no kidding. Way worse. So she gave birth to a baby boy, but her Caesars had returned with a vengeance during this time. Oh, that's rough. Which is really sad because, you know, it's like you're trying to care for a baby. You're worried about holding the baby. You Mm -hmm. can't stand up with the baby because you're always worried you're going to have a seizure and drop the baby. And she's already so concerned about her children. So that, I mean, and then that causes you more stress. And then, I mean, so it is sad. Yeah. I'm not justifying anything that she's going to do. Okay? I have no clue what she's up to. I want you guys to know I this. I really feel bad for this lady. I do feel really bad for this lady. I think she had a lot of mental health issues. It does not justify anything that she's about to do, though. Okay. FYI. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. That's all I'm going to say. Because I feel like we're being, <laughs> being very, like, complimentary. poor Leonardo. Like, it, in a way, it is really sad. You know, but... I, think, I think you can kind of see the buildup of all of these things and... No one is like even no one even understood postpartum depression, oh, yeah. which I'm sure was raging in her, and the fact she lost ten kids that she's lo- like she's grieving constantly. Like I can't, yeah, I can't imagine it. So well, you know what? Normal, regular, happy people don't um, do terrible things, most likely. No, no, so it all right. makes sense. I know. It's just, it's very, very sad to me. This whole thing is tragic. Mm-hmm. I think that's really what it is. It's like there's so many things that like people could have intervened or things could have changed. And like, you know, you think, well, that's why we have, you know, different laws that pass now because this sh- sort of shit happens mm-hmm. and people don't get help when they need help. Mm-hmm. And it's good to tell these stories because like 
this is this is this is what happened. This is what used to happen. Right. So it's good that we they were trying to change things out there in the world. So um Okay, yeah. Her Caesars came back, but you know, she during this whole time she was visiting fortune tellers again and again and again. She was kind of getting a little obsessed. Okay. In 1930, during harvest time in Lacedonia, people would like this is, sounds really fun. People would celebrate in the fields. They would hold feasts in the fields. Families would even camp out in the fields. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Like, they would, like, dance out there and do all kinds of fun stuff. And I was like, wow, like, that sounds really neat. I would do that. <laughs> yeah. So one night, one night, Leonardo and Raffaele were camping in the fields with their children. And, you know, after having their little feast or whatever for harvest, well, a horrible earthquake hit. Who? It was the 1930... Or Pinia, I think I'm saying that right, earthquake, killed a little over 1,400 people. Wow. Yeah. Almost all of them in Avellino, which was centered around the little town of Lacedonia. And every single home was destroyed by the time that the aftershocks had stopped a day later, and it would be 40 years before serious reconstruction of the town had finally undertaken. Wow, like the yeah. 70s. That was directly taken from the book that I told you about. Yeah, so it was catastrophic yeah it was a catastrophic thing and honestly it was catastrophic not just that way but also to her mental health because i think she was finally starting to feel a little bit like you know she's kind of cruising along yeah. you know and the she was certain that this was the curse she brought this upon she the brought town. this on and that also kind of shows her narcissism like the entire world revolves around you yeah. i don't think that you know but she just didn't see that and your mother is not that powerful and your mother's not that powerful. Yeah. And so they also lost everything. All their possessions, everything. Like their entire, everything crumbled to the ground. And At least they, they were out in the fields, though. I know. And that's they the thing. They would have died. If they were not sleeping out in the fields, they probably would have died. Yeah. Because people who were in their homes, it was just like crumbled onto them. Oh. And they died. So Leonardo ended up having a total of 17 pregnancies. She had three miscarriages. Ten deaths. 10 baby deaths and ultimately four children survived. Okay. So her surviving children were Giuseppe Pansardi, Biagio Pansardi, Norma Pansardi, and Bernardo Pansardi. So it looks like, like Bernardo. She had, I do too. I think it's such a cute name. Uh, and so it looks like she had three boys and one girl. Okay. Okay. So after the earthquake, they moved to Correggio and this was the first time that they really felt settled. They had a nice home. They had some savings, finally, which is the first time they've ever had that. Yeah. Raffaele had a clerical job, and even though Leonardo was was really fragile, I think, emotionally at this time, she did start making friends. Okay. She was popular socially in the town, um, and their house was attached to an empty storefront, and it was it was just empty for a long time. They just didn't really do anything with it. But she decided after a time that she wanted to do something with it. Open that store, girl. She opened that store and she started selling soap. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, you know, you're selling your little waxies. Yeah. <laughs> They're fun to mix. Yeah. So her store was actually a huge success. Oh, that's cool. Townsfolk loved it. I bet that felt so good. Give for me her. some soap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, we stink. <laughs> they might um so and because of her interest in fortune telling she started attracting a whole different clientele hmm. bored housewives of correggio <laughs> <laughs> coming at you <laughs> she actually started providing some predictions and lo and behold some of them started coming true people were Hello. like leonardo knows what's up let's okay. go see her right the freaky soap lady knows what's up i know so you're not sure what crop to plant ask the soap maker Oh. Not sure which suitor to choose for your future hubby hub? Ask the soap maker. Okay. Yeah. So her fortune telling was an open secret in town. And pretty soon when the Romani caravans were passing through, which, you know, they were passing all over the place. Mm -hmm. She was corresponding with them. She was trading information with them. Books and things. Okay. Some of them on the occult. Okay. Dark magic books. She started diving very deeply into folk magic and other rituals. Okay. Okay. So you can see what I rose. don't love this. I don't love it. No, I think she started out really well, and then it just took a turn there. Yeah. So 
Pretty soon, people learned of the other services that she could offer. When a girl found herself unexpectedly pregnant outside of wedlock, you could also go down and see the soap maker. because She's got some herbs that could help you out. Okay. Yeah. When a hubby was like, you know, I can't get it up. <laughs> Let me go talk to the soap maker. She's going to get my bow chicka wow wow. Okay. She's going to get it back in order. Yeah. So that's kind of what she was also seeing people for. So she was kind of known as like the fixer. Like she would mm-hmm. fix things. She would find things. Um, and she really helped people with sickness, fertility, loyalty, luck. Like she was kind of known for that. Okay. Which is not a bad thing. I think that's actually a kind of cute. I mean, maybe not the, you know, some of the herb things, but maybe some of them were natural things that helped certain people with certain things. Yeah. You know. So in 1939, nearly 10 years after they moved to Correggio, World War II broke out. There's always something, isn't there? Yes. Giuseppe was 17 at this time, and he was ready to leave home. Okay. I think he loved his mother, but I think he found her extremely stifling and over the top. Smother. Yeah. Yeah. She was his mother, and she was always so afraid that he would die. She never let him live. That's really it. Like, she never let him live. I know. So the propaganda at that time made joining the war look super awesome. (laughs) Like, you're going to be a hero. It's going to be super easy, you know. And he was all over it. He's like, yeah, this this is definitely for me. So he went down in secret and enlisted. Oh. And Leonardo, however was alive during World War I, and she remembered it very vividly. She was not so blind to the propaganda. Right. And she saw how men had died, how they were disfigured. Like, she she knew in her heart that, you know... It's not a good place for her baby yeah, boy. Yeah. So when, when she finally found out about it, she was very upset, but calm. Mm-hmm. And she realized that she needed to find the best spell she could to protect him. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, She's really following in her mother's footsteps. Yeah. So she delved very deeply into her magic books and things. Dark magic. Dark magic. Yeah. So in her research, she realized that in order to save a life, she would need to take a life. Oh. Yeah. But it wasn't just enough to like hand him this protection. Not for she Giuseppe. had to get this protection all over him, inside him. Ew. All of it. Like it needed to be like from within. Okay. Yeah. So after she thought a lot about this and did a lot of research, she figured the best way to protect him is use, utilizing the two things that she knows best, food and soap. Okay. Because he's going to eat the food. The soap's going to be on his body. Okay. It makes sense yeah. in a weird eat and wash yourself. Yeah. I get it. So she started hatching her plan. And she'd actually never killed, I mean, she'd never killed anyone before. She never thought about hurting anyone before. But I think in her mind, this was warranted because, you know, she was, I don't even want to say low-key obsessed with her son, especially her older son, Giuseppe. High-key obsessed. She was high-key obsessed. And I think at this point, the mental health was rampant. Like, she, you know, there was no assistance for her. There was a screw loose. There's something loose. There is more than one. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So every day she had appointments scheduled with the women of the town and the ones that came to her most frequently were the ones who were like most alone, most vulnerable. I mean, it's also a social call. You go to the soap shop and you get to chat and have some tea cakes. Who doesn't love a tea cake? Mm -hmm. Right. So many of the town's women would come to Leonardo to discuss matters of love. I mean, she'd been instrumental in making many matches. She'd help many in town find successful marriages. She was actually pretty good at it. Huh. Like matching people up. And so out of all the women in Correggio, there was one woman who'd been in the most need of a marriage and probably like also the butt of the most jokes. Aww. And her name was Faustina Setti. And so she had been very unlucky in love. She was in her 40s now, mm-hmm. which is unheard of at that time to be, con- to be single. So she, I mean, I think she'd had marriage proposals that have fallen through. Like, she just never had anything happen right for her as far as marriage. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So Leonardo had been trying to find Faustina a husband for a while. So she told Faustina, I, I found a match for you. There's a man in Pola. And this is, th- this is the country that would later become part of Croatia. I'm not sure about all that area. but oh, okay. So it kind of gives you an idea of where it is. Mm-hmm. A- um, and he, she told Faustina, I sent this man your picture. He saw your picture. He's fallen in love with you. I've been sending him letters on your behalf. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've arranged for this marriage to be made. You know? And this is like all of Faustina's dreams coming true. Right. She's like, <laughs> yeah, sign me the fuck up. Right? And so she told Faustina this, okay, look, you need to write a letter to each of your friends explaining that you're traveling to Pola to meet your new husband and you're starting a new life. Okay. Okay. And then I'll arrange for each of your letters and postcards to be sent to your friends over the next coming weeks. Okay. I'll take care of everything. So just write those letters. Okay. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And so she told her, come back the next morning with your bags packed, like, Give me all your money for this passage that you're going to be doing. Right. Which she did. She literally gave her her life savings. Because this is like your ultimate last moment. Yeah. And can, I mean. This is it for you. If you don't take this opportunity, nothing will ever happen for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you could think nowadays, well, that's so crazy that people would do that. But I'm sorry. People travel across the the country is to meet people they just met online. So this is not yeah. so unheard of. Nope. You know. And so she was very, very excited for her new life, you know? I mean, she probably was just over the moon. So the next morning, she so she shows up with her bags packed. Leonardo gave her some wine to, like, calm her nerves. Like, okay, let's take some breaths. You know, it's going to be fine. Everything's great. Well, of course, her wine was laced with herbs oh. that would incapacitate her. Okay. And, and then as she lay paralyzed, Leonardo struck her with an axe. Okay. But her aim was off because she was not an axeman. I mean, Raffaele did all the wood cutting. No. So she actually. She's a soap maker. She's a soap maker. Yeah. So she actually hit her shoulder instead of her head. So then she had to like retry and then she got her head and then she proceeded to chop her into pieces and drain her blood. In her kitchen. Ew. <laughs> that's all you got. Ew. <laughs> yeah. So that's what she did. So she actually hung the body parts from herb drying racks or hooks and let them drain into basins. And so, you know, she had a lot of equipment and pots and things for making her soap. So right. she was very well prepared for this. She she needed the blood to form the basis of protection Giuseppe would carry inside of him. So that's what she's going to have him have inside of him. Okay. okay. So she emptied the blood into trays and slid them into the roasting oven so the blood would dry out. And she could utilize it. Okay. So she took pieces of Faustina and placed them in pots of caustic soda. And this is the compound that you use to render fat into soap. Oh, it's like Fight Club. Yeah. it's. I'm pretty sure that Fight Club might have gotten their idea of that from this story. Okay. Yeah. I read something about that. Hmm. It's a possibility. I'm not saying it's true. I mean. But it's a possibility. You get ideas from everywhere, but if... I've never heard of somebody boiling down people for their fat and making soap and then selling it. Exactly. Back to, yeah. Yeah. So it was actually powerful enough to dissolve every single part, that, like including hair and bones. Oh, wow. So it's very powerful. She then prepared the ingredients for tea cakes. <laughs> okay. She rendered down the fat. She took the trays out of the oven. And when she took the trays out, there was like thin rust colored coating along the bottom of each, which was the dried blood. Right. So she had to scrape it off into the bowl with the flour, sugar, and eggs to prepare the tea cake. So she's basically just putting in dried blood in there. That's disgusting. Yeah. Like, well, do you want tea cakes that taste like pennies? Yeah, I know. Exactly. But her soap recipe was disgusting. Like, she couldn't even stomach it. Oh. So she ended up dumping that. Oh. Okay. But, of course, she needed to try again. She fed the tea cakes to friends and family including Giuseppe, but in her mind, the tea cakes would not do anything because the ritual was not complete. So it had to be soap and tea cakes. Like they both had to to work together. So if you just had the tea cakes or you just had the soap, like it's not really helping. So she had to try again. Oh God. Yeah. 
So two weeks later, she had another chance. And she also decided during this time that she probably needed a younger victim. Like maybe the first soap batch didn't work because Faustina had been older. <laughs> what? I know. Yeah. So okay. she did, it was August 1940, and it was only three months before Giuseppe was due to leave. So she was like, I need to get this sh- show on the road. Yeah. Okay. Francesca Suave was a school teacher in Correggio for many years, and she retired early to care for her husband, who was actually got very sick and died. Hmm. She was younger than Leonardo, but she had no children. Okay. And she needed to find work. So she had come to Leonardo for help. Like, I need to find work. I've been with my sick husband for so long, and now I'm a widow. So Leonardo fed her a story about a job working for an elite girls' school in Piacenza, Piacenza, which is in the northeast, or I mean, sorry, northwest towards Switzerland, that direction. Mm -hmm. So the same song and dance ensued. She drugged Francesca. She proceeded to axe ax her okay ax her <laughs> but she's gonna ax her but this time she was more calm she was more methodical okay okay she i feel like the first time she was like very frenzied it was like her first time she, and she tries was just to put like, bones and soap though i don't know that's why it didn't work i don't know if she put all the bones in there but i think she just wanted i don't know you have to put like it's just fat i know you can't just put all the extra shit in there <laughs> You weirdo. Yeah, you should tell her that. <laughs> yeah, don't you know how to make soap? What's wrong with you? She's a soap maker. So she swung the axe at her head and did not miss this time. She separated the head, torso, and limbs. Okay. And Leonardo saw that Francesca had more fat on her body than Faustina, which was a welcome sight when you're boiling up some soap. Yeah. Yeah. So she's like, okay, that's probably why it didn't work. I need more fat. Mm-hmm. So she drained the blood, filled every baking tray to the rim with blood, Ugh. started bubbling away her flesh in the big pots, and the tea cakes this time had a very distinctive iron taste to them. I bet. She tasted them herself. She ate them. Um, but she was certain that that meant the spell was working. Oh, like, sure. Like, okay, it's working now. But again, her soap was a fucking disaster. Oh, no. She dumped it. What a fucking waste, you know? Yeah, she had to practice. Yeah. So now for round three. You'd think one and done. I mean, how many bars of soap do you think you could get out of somebody's body? I don't know, but she didn't even get one. What a ding dong. So her final victim was Virginia Cachopo. Cachopo. Yeah, I think I'm saying it right. She was a former soprano who'd sung at such famous opera houses. No. It's just in famous opera houses in Milan. I don't know any famous opera houses in Milan. I can't name any for you. I don't know one famous <laughs> opera house. I guess besides the Sydney Opera House. Oh, yeah. And then the one that's in uh, the one France the that we talked about last week. The one with the lake. <laughs> yeah. So she was, um, Virginia was actually known throughout the town. She was very well known. She was adored by the locals. Okay, people really liked her. She had fine clothes, perfumes, and she, you know, she had a good education. And Leonardo did view her as a great friend. Oh, okay. They had bonded over their love of the arts. Leonardo had actually started writing poetry at one point. Wow. And Virginia singing. So they kind of, you know, bonded over those things. Okay. And, you know, she would come visit Leonardo a lot and they would hang out. Well, Virginia was planning on leaving town. You know, she could not find a worthy job there, and she, she, needed to sing. she wanted to move on. Yeah. Well, Leonardo might have felt a little betrayed by this, Aww. especially if she felt that she was a great friend. And also because she's so fucking clingy. And she's so fucking clingy. And desperate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So she decided that Virginia was the perfect person to try out her next soap recipe. Yeah. Virginia. So... Also, Virginia was different in Leonardo's eyes because when she would die, Leonardo would truly be sad. Like, she would truly grieve for the the loss of her friend. Right. So she thought maybe that pain was the fuel that the magic needed. Oh, God. Okay? Because, you know, killing somebody that you don't really care about is not really a fair trade for saving Giuseppe, but killing someone you do care about is like a fair trade. Does that make sense? 
it makes sense. <laughs> well, it made sense to Leonardo. Not in the way that you would think that it should make sense, but it does technically make sense. Yeah. So she told Virginia, I found a job for you, but it's cloaked in mystery Ooh. and it's really secretive. Well, and of course, friend. Virginia loved the mystery of it. Yeah. You know? And Leonardo told Virginia the job was secretarial and she would be managing the household of a working man and the job was related to the arts. So her background in the theater would be essential. Okay. And this man was super private. So everything had to be kind of like done on the down low. Ooh. I like how I'm like wiggling my shoulders and no one can see. Down low. <laughs> it's on the down low. So on the morning of September 30th, 1940, Virginia made her way to Leonardo's house and of course to her fate. She, Leonardo offered her wine. Of course. And at first Virginia was like, dude, it's morning. I don't want this. You know, it's, I don't, you know, I don't want a wine. Yeah. But Leonardo was insistent and Virginia was a nice friend and did not want to disappoint her. She's like, okay, if it's so important to you, I'll drink the wine. Okay. Guess what? Just disappoint your friends. Don't drink the fucking wine. Don't drink the wine. All right. Well, she drank the wine. And then when she was knocked out, Leonardo got to work. (sighs) Oh. She axed her first in the chest, then separated her body parts. She started the entire process of the boiling and the baking of the blood again. Okay. Also, God, wouldn't she just be exhausted from cleaning up this blood every time? Because, I mean, like, she had to clean this up because people would come into the kitchen later. That's what I'm thinking is, like, she must have been a strong fucking lady. She looked pretty sturdy. She's, like, busting open whole people yeah and i'm gonna post a picture of her she definitely looked like a sturdy woman that's like taking down a you know at least a big deer and there's like like, a person there's this picture of her and Raffaele, and he just looks like (laughs) he looks like the sweetest clueless little guy like he's just wearing like these horn room glasses and he's just kind of like you know his mouth's kind of hanging open and he just he looks totally clueless squinting (laughs) like but super squinting into the sun (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and she's just sitting there next to him, like, with a stern face. Aww. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, just... I saw a picture of her. The first thing I noticed about her was her nose. Oh, I don't recall that. Yeah, they had, like, a side profile of her, and it was like, bam. Oh, nose. Well. She was known as for being a beauty. She had a schnoz. And she had a schnoz. So, where was I? Oh, oh, yeah. So, she got to work on that whole situation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, she... Okay, but this time, when she started... You know, doing her little pot boilage. She <laughs> pot boilage. <laughs> she she took the entire bottle of Virginia's expensive perfume and dumped it into the mixture. Okay, because she's like, you know what? Let's let's give this a whirl. So this time with the tea cakes, there was no penny taste. Okay. They were sweet and delicious. Well, maybe she had good blood. And the soap was rich and creamy and was scented with floral goodness, which was her perfume. Okay. Mm-hmm. So when Giuseppe came home, so this is kind of weird. Okay, he's like 18 at this point. Mm-hmm. Okay. I have an almost 18-year-old son, so like I'm just kind of envisioning this in my mind. Mm-hmm. She pretty much forced him to take a bath, and she washed him. Okay. And he was extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, he's like, what the fuck And I really doing? feel like that was like the last straw, you know? And I don't, I'm not exactly sure. I'm sure he could have overpowered her, but I do feel like... She is a very strong woman, and I think it was one of those situations where it's like your mom, and you're just like, what the fuck's happening? Yeah. So she proceeded to wash his entire body with this soap, okay? And he was none too pleased, but he, and he was basically like, what the fuck? But it happened, okay? Yeah. Well, his mom's been weird his whole life. And she's been weird his whole life, and he knows and that. Like, okay, whatever, mom. Yeah, there's always something, right? So afterwards, she made him sit at the table and eat some tea cakes. And she was on top of the world. Oh, he's saved now. Yeah, her spell had to work now. So she felt like she'd provided him the protection that he needed. Hmm. So Virginia's sister-in-law, though, was really close with her. Almost, you know, like her own sister. So Virginia had been living with her brother at the time. Okay. And so, you know, when she left, she said goodbye to her brother. But for some reason, her sister-in-law wasn't there when she left Hmm. and said goodbye. Um. But her sister-in-law was really suspicious about this whole thing. Like, what What do you what mean, man? this whole mysterious... Yeah. yeah. So she didn't believe this job story. And she started to do a little investigating of her own. Oh, okay. She actually went to Leonardo and, 
you know, went to her house and talked to her and, you know, Leonardo was welcoming and gracious, but she's like, I don't have any other information. That's all I have. Blah, blah, blah. But you set her up with the thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's very odd. So the sister-in-law went next door to talk to a neighbor Mm -hmm. and the neighbor's like, oh yeah, I saw Virginia go in. Never saw her came out. Mm. Never saw her come out. So she went to the police and, you know, to report this. And pretty quickly they found out there was other women who went to Leonardo's house and were never seen again. Right. Interesting. So their first thought, Giuseppe. They thought Giuseppe did this. Oh. Yeah. So they searched the house and found. Is that here, dude? Yeah. They searched the house and found luggage and other items belonging to the victims because Leonardo was an idiot and did not get rid of it. (laughs) Um, You know, so she had some things there and they were thinking, oh, Giuseppe did this. Giuseppe lured these women. He killed, you know, because they they never immediately think a woman's doing this. No, yeah. You know? Because, so. Yeah, why? why? Exactly. So they brought Giuseppe in for questioning. Because they were like, dude, what the fuck? And And he's he's like, like, I'm traumatized. My mom just gave me a fucking bath. (laughs) And I'm an adult. And touched my private area. (laughs) And I'm really upset about it. (laughs) Like, just kept talking about the soap. (laughs) And I don't care about the soap. So, of course, you know, Leonardo can't allow this to happen, you know, to her precious son. So pretty soon she's down there, like, telling them, you know. Like, you didn't do anything. It was me. It was me. It was me. It was me. Oh, she (laughs) confessed. She went down there to confess. And they were like. Okay, sure, Mama Sita. Like, we know you're just trying to protect your son. We don't believe anything that you're saying. And she's like, well, let me give you some detailed shit. Oh. Okay. So she started talking, and they realized pretty soon that the per- only the person responsible could know some of this shit that she was saying. Okay. You know? So they thought, well, shit, this lady's for real. So she's like, I baked them in the cake. Yeah. And then she, yeah, I know. And she did. She told them everything. I made the soap. I did the thing. So I made weird. the tea cakes. I'm I trying did the to thing. save my son's life. Yeah. She told him everything. Well, of course they go tell Giuseppe this. And what would be your response if you just realized that you had been washed head to toe in oh, God. person soap. And you had just eaten the blood cakes. Yeah. So of course he's vomiting all yeah. over the place. And he, Basically, it was like, yeah, she's got issues. She's, yeah. Let me tell you about my life. <laughs> she's unhinged. Yeah. But she felt completely vindicated in what she'd done. Like, she had zero remorse. Right. Like, she's like, well, I did what I did. She's like, My son's protected. She's like, wouldn't Boom. you do anything to save your kid's life? Yeah. So it took multiple years, like six, for them to build this case against her and bring her to court. And I think most of it was because it was during World War II. Like, oh, it was a clusterfuck. There's a lot of shit going yeah. on. So she kind of loved the attention at trial and she would like interrupt lawyers and she would like start laughing like maniacally and she pretty much acted unhinged during her trial. Yeah. I mean, something's definitely off. Yeah. So at one point, an expert witness was brought out to discuss the method that she'd used to dispose of the bodies. And he was a coroner that had experience with acids Okay. And he claimed that a body couldn't be destroyed with a caustic soda in the way that she had described. She's like, did you try my soap dog? <laughs> she, was, she was enraged and said, quote, bring a body to court. Give me a body of any age right now and I shall prove it. <laughs> I mean, I can't make soap out of a body. Yeah, bitches. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so she was actually convicted in three days. Oh. Yeah. Took six years, but convicted in three days. I know. And they were just shuttling her around for six years to different prisons. And then here, she was convicted in three days. What happened to her other kids? We shall see. Okay. So her sentence was 30 years in prison, followed by a three-year stint in a mental asylum to ensure that she was safe to return to to society. That's her one hand and her other hand, just like they said. I was just going to say that. Good job, (laughs) Ebron. So the prophecy came true. Yeah. Yeah. This is your one hand. Here's your other hand. So she was placed in Puzzuoli Prison. Okay. So she settled in well there. I mean, she probably had, like, a pretty good life. You know, she was fed. She had a place to, you know, lay her head. Yeah. She got a job in the kitchen. And the other prisoners really enjoyed her treats and her sweets. (laughs) So they know her background with treats and sweets. I feel like they probably had to have. Yeah. Yeah. 
So she actually wrote a book while she was incarcerated titled The Confessions of an Embittered Soul. She wrote about her life story, starting with the rape of her mother, her abusive upbringing, suicide attempts, and her adulthood and her obsession with the occult. That's not the book you read, right? No. Okay. I can't fucking find this book. Oh. Even if I did, it would probably all be in Italian. I couldn't read it. Oh, yeah, I didn't think but, about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if I ever did find a version, I'm dying to read it because she also filled it with recipes along with detailed descriptions of the way that she dismembered her corpses of her okay. victims. She even included the tea cake recipe, minus the blood, right next to the depiction of her draining her victims. Oh, God. Yeah, and her book was one of the most complete collections of traditional Italian baking techniques ever written and is still referred to by some of the top chefs of Italy today. What? So there you fucking go. That's so weird. (laughs) I love it. That's why I want a copy of it. Yeah. Wait, what was it called again? It was called The Confessions of an Embittered Soul. Yeah, so I would like to have that in my kitchen right now. <laughs> Please. <Yeah. laughs> I think we can find it. I think we I could. think we need to find out uh, what Confessions of an Embittered Soul is in Italian and yeah. look that up. I That's know. That's probably the name of it. That probably is. So 20 years into her sentence, she started having minor strokes and brain bleeding, and they determined that it was caustic soda vapor poisoning. Oh. Which is kind of like poetic in a weird twisted way get what you get yeah so the same material of course that she'd used to eat through her victim's flesh that's what she's dying of she died on the 14th of october 1970 at the age of 76 wow she lived to be pretty old yeah so i'm pretty sure that giuseppe never went to visit her oh yeah or any of her other children yeah no yeah so every one of her surviving she washed in the Dead people, so. I can't imagine that poor child. So every one of her surviving children went through a period of hiding after the trial began. I bet. And Raffaele died before she even stood trial because he started drinking too much. Oh. I know, which really makes me sad. So her two younger children most likely changed their names, married and settled elsewhere, which I think, based on what I read, it was kind of an, you know, one of the best times to do it because... Again, this was during World War II. It was a clusterfuck. I mean, there's so much information lost. And yeah. it's not like nowadays, obviously, where you have computers and things like that. So I think it was very easy for them to do that. And I mean, wouldn't you do that? Yeah. I would do that. I mean, she was notorious at the time. So right. as for Giuseppe, there is a record of his deployment to the African theater, like during World War II. But after that, there's no trace of him. He probably changed his name. Yeah. So either... Either he died in the fields of Africa, Mm -hmm. which he could have, or he had successfully changed his name. It's really a mystery at that point. And the sad part is she tried so hard to save him and she lost him forever. Yeah. Her relationship with, I mean, that, that was it. Right. You know, I mean, so that was that. And that is the story of Leonardo Chanchuli. Chanchula. The tea cake and soap maker. Wow. That's quite the story. (laughs) Yeah. Isn't that wild? Like, I mean, I'd kind of like heard of this before, but I had no idea about all like her whole childhood and everything. I got to find this book. I thought it was crazy. But yeah, if anyone knows where I can find this book. (laughs) I want to look it up right now. I need to know where can I find the book? I mean, I think I feel like it would be a really great book to bust out during a party. Be like, I'm going to make you some tea cakes. <laughs> Confessions of an Embittered Soul book. Yeah, but you can't buy it. I looked. Trust me, I did. Used on thrift books. What? Oh, that's the story of a soul. Yeah, it's something different. We'll do some research. We'll report back to you guys if we can actually find it. Yeah, maybe. Because I have a feeling it's Ooh. difficult. World ebook fair? I don't know, dude. We'll see. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the story today. It was a good one. You liked it? Yeah. Yeah, I think the drink was good. It was good. Yeah. This was, yeah. I Though we like- needed tea cakes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't know it was tea cakes. I knew it was soap, but. Do you want to tell them where to find us? Yes, you can find us 
Oh, you can email us if you'd like to chat about our podcast or tell us about a thing you want to hear about or a drink you want us to try at killerspiritspod at gmail.com. Um, we're also on Instagram at killerspiritspod. We're on TikTok at killerspiritspod. We do some drink um, videos. Where else are we? Did you say Instagram already? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go see our drinks oh, there. And on Patreon, we post um, full versions of our drink making videos. Yeah, so you can have the recipe. So you can uh, make it along with us. That'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah, and if you ever do have drinks, tag us on it because I want to see it. Oh, yeah. If you ever make our drinks, tag us on it. I would it. love it. That'd All right, cool. guys. Thank you so much for listening. Bye. Bye.